The City at World's End Chapter 12 Crisis Three men of Earth stared at the big Capellan, and for a long, long moment no one spoke. Gore Hall became absorbed in the glass he held between his hands. Magra watched them with his bright cat eyes. The beautiful streaming light poured over them, and the men were like three images of stone. Bertram Garris found his tongue at last, but it was only to repeat Gore Hall's words, as Keniston had translated them. Evacuation? he said. And again, Evacuation? To the world of another star, said Keniston slowly. His mouth twitched, and he leaned close to Gore Hall and cried, What do you think we're made of? Gore Hall looked around their faces, and then said ruefully, I guess I've talked too much. His ruefulness was no more convincing than his earlier surprise. Mayor Garris had begun to tremble. A fury was building up in him, a genuine fury that had nothing to do with display. He glared at Magro and Gore Hall. "'They knew this all along, that woman and the others,' he said. "'They came in here, pretending to be our friends, and all the time behind our backs—' He stopped. His wrath and fear were all but choking him coming so swiftly after joy. His voice went up an octave. "'You tell them, Keniston, tell them from me, if they think we're going to move clear off the earth to some, some—' He stammered over the sheer impossibility of what he was saying. "'Some damn fool place out in the sky. Well, they're crazy.' Hubble said to Keniston, "'Ask him if this is a thing they do, these governors. I mean, this moving of whole populations from one world to another.' Gore Hall nodded to that. "'Oh, yes. Whenever life on some planet becomes economically unsound, or the margin of survival is too small, the governors evacuate the people to a better world. There are lots of them—good, warm, fertile planets that are uninhabited, or nearly so. They did it to some of my own people, moved them from Capella V to Aldebaran." Keniston cried out of his anger, "'And people let that be done to them? They didn't even resist it?' Gore Hall said, "'People, human people, I mean, have got millions of years of civilization behind them. They're used to peaceful government used to obedience, and they've been moving from world to world ever since they left Earth ages ago, so that one planet doesn't mean much more than another to them. But the primitive humanoid folk, lately civilized, like my own and Magro's, aren't so reasonable. There's been a good bit of resentment among them about this evacuation business. In fact, they hate it, just as much as you do." Here, said Hubble sharply, where are you going? He was talking to the mayor, who was striding suddenly toward the door. He caught Garris by the coat and pulled him back. The mayor struggled sullenly to free himself. I'm going to tell them, he said, jerking his head toward the sounds of revelry that came from the crowd of Middletowners in the plaza. Move off the earth? They'll have something to say about that. "'What do you want to do?' snapped Hubble. "'Start a riot? Don't be a fool. That's no way to handle this. No, it's that ice-water blonde we've got to talk to, and that fellow Lund.' He shook Garris. "'Stop it, I say. Going off half-cocked will only make it harder for everyone.' Garris stopped struggling. He looked from Hubble to Keniston and back again. "'All right,' he said. We'll talk to them. But they better get it through their heads that they're not dealing with any flock of tame sheep." He stamped back into the room. "'Ordering us off our own world. Get those two freaks out of here, Keniston. I was right the first time. 
They're not to be trusted. They're—' "'Oh, shut up!' said Keniston impatiently. "'Gore and Magro don't make the laws. They're simply being decent enough to give us fair warning of something we wouldn't have known about until it was too late.' He knew there was more in it than that, but he was too hurried and upset to search for deeper motives now. He turned to Gore and the Spike and— "'Listen,' he said. "'You've seen how the mayor reacted. Well, I can assure you that all our people will react just that way, only more so. Tell that to Varn Allen, and tell her that she better come here and talk about this evacuation before she gets in too deep. Tell her we don't like having things done behind our backs. Tell her—' He caught himself, surprised by his own fury. "'No, I guess you couldn't tell her that,' he said, and Gore Hall grinned. "'As one primitive to another, I get your meaning.' "'Well, all right. And, Gore, you and Magro and the others better stay out of the city.' When this thing breaks, I wouldn't guarantee anybody's safety." "'Oh,' said Gore Hall, and grinned very widely, so that even his grinders glistened. "'We'll be quite safe, confined to quarters in the ship. We, or rather I, have done an evil thing. We have spoken out of turn and upset the policy.'" The three of them, humanoids and human, looked at each other and there was understanding between them. Keniston put his hand on Gore Hall's furry shoulder, and gripped the iron muscles of it, and Magro said, "'One more thing, Keniston. If there's trouble, and I seem to smell trouble very strongly in the air, watch out for Lund. Varn Allen may be much too sure of herself, but she's honest. Lund? Well, he wants Varn's job and he will cheerfully cut anyone's throat to get it." "'That is so,' said Gore Hall. "'Remember, Keniston.' "'I'll remember, and thanks.' They went away to take the message of defiance to the ship. Keniston watched them go, and the mayor watched them, and they listened to the cheering that followed them all the way to the portal. "'I'm sorry I called them freaks.' the mayor said suddenly. By God, they're more like us than the people in that ship. Hubble nodded. Their culture level is closer to ours. They haven't lost their old aboriginal roots. Our own people have gone too far beyond us. The whole pattern of their thinking is different. We, well, we're strangers now to our own kind. To Keniston, the cheering and the happiness of the Middletowners out there was an ironically bitter thing now, if they knew what was being planned for them. He said to Hubble, nodding his head toward the mayor, "'Will you stick with him and keep him from telling everyone? He'll listen to you more than to anyone.' Hubble said, "'I will. You get some sleep, Ken. You've been working a tough grind. And the Allen woman and Lund won't likely come before morning." And Keniston slept, but neither much nor well. In spite of his exhaustion, Gore Hall's words rang like passing bells in his mind all the rest of that night. Evacuate, evacuate, to the world of another star. And he thought of all the people of Middletown who happily believed their troubles were over, and of Carol particularly of Carol, and most of all he thought of Varn Allen, whom he had begun to hate, and he was afraid. It did not take much imagination to divine what the mayor's narrowness had missed, a vast and powerful machinery of government directing this future universe, a machinery of which the big starship and its occupants were but a symbol. It did not seem likely that a handful of people on a dying planet could successfully defy that government for very long. Hubble woke him at last out of an uneasy slumber to tell him that Varn Allen and Lund had come, 
and that the mayor had called the city council. "'We need you to interpret, Ken,' he said. "'You speak the language better than any of us, and this is too important to take any chances of misunderstanding.' Neither of them talked very much on the way to the soaring tower that was now City Hall, and Keniston could see that Hubble was as worried and oppressed as he. A crowd had gathered in the plaza, a happy crowd, come to cheer their good friends who had helped them so much. Inside City Hall the Council of Middletown sat around a massive metal table. The mayor, Borcher the coal dealer, Moretti, the wholesale produce merchant, half a dozen more, facing at one end of the table the woman and the man who came from Vega and who were administrators over a vast sector of space with all its worlds and peoples. Mayor Garris fastened on Keniston the moment he came in. He looked as though he had slept even less than Keniston, and his mood had not changed since the night before. You ask her, Keniston, he said, you ask her if this evacuation story is true. He asked her. Varn Allen nodded. Quite true. I'm sorry that Gore Hall spoke so prematurely. It seems to have upset your people. She glanced at the ominous faces of the city council and the tense countenance of the mayor. It struck Keniston that she had been all through this situation before with other populations, and was attacking the problem with a kind of weary patience. "'I am sure,' she said, "'that when they understand, they will realize that we are only serving their best interests.' "'Best interests!' cried Garris, when he had heard that. "'Then why didn't you tell us at first? Why plan this behind our backs?" Norden Lund, a smug look on his face, said to the woman, "'I told you it would have been better.' "'We'll discuss that later,' she flashed. Keniston could see the effort she made to keep her imperious temper in check as she went on, speaking directly to him. "'We wanted to wait until we could present a complete plan of evacuation so as not to upset your people too much. "'In other words,' said Keniston angrily, "'you were dealing with a bunch of primitive aborigines who had to be coaxed along?' "'Aren't you acting in just such a fashion?' Varn Allen demanded. Again she visibly got a grip on her irritation. She said, carefully, as though explaining to a child, a ship full of evacuation experts is on its way here, should arrive soon. They can assess the needs of your people and find a world that will fit their physical and psychological needs. We will see that it is a world as much like your past Earth as possible." That, said Keniston ironically, is very decent of you. The woman's blue eyes flashed open hostility at him. He turned away from her, for Garrus was demanding a translation. He gave it, and in his own resentment he did not soften it. Garrus forgot oratory in his indignation. He sputtered, "'If they think we're going to move away from Earth to some crazy world out in the sky, they're badly mistaken. You make that clear to them.' Varn Allen looked honestly bewildered when Keniston did. "'But surely you people don't want to stay in the cold and hardship of this dying world?' Keniston, watching the anger and the instinctive, basic fear grow still stronger in the mayor's white face, could understand his feelings. His own reaction was the same. "'Not want to stay here?' said Garris forcing words out painfully from a throat constricted with emotion. Not want to? Listen, you people, we have left our own time. We have had to leave our own city, our homes. That's enough. It's all we can stand in one lifetime. Leave Earth? Leave our own world? No!" 
There was no oratory about him now at all. He was like a man who has been asked to die. Keniston spoke to Varn Allen. His own voice was not quite steady. Try to understand. We are earth-born. Our whole life, all the generations before us, since the beginning. He could not put it into words, this sudden passionate oneness with earth. The earth hath he given to the children of men, the earth, the soil, the winds and the rains, the growth and the dying over the ages, beast and tree and man. You could not forget that. You could not let drop the heritage of a world as though it had never been. The sorrel-haired Norden Lund was speaking to Varn Allen, looking contemptuously at the Middletowners as he spoke. I warned you, Varn that these primitives are too emotional for ordinary methods." The woman, her blue eyes troubled, ignored Lund and addressed Keniston. "'You must make them recognize the facts. Life here is impossible, and therefore they must go.' "'Let her tell that to the people,' said the mayor, in an oddly tight voice. "No." I'll tell them myself." He rose and left the council room. There was a curious dignity about his plump figure now. Borchard and Moretti and the others followed. They too showed a shrinking, instinctive dread of the thing that had been proposed. They went out on the steps, and Keniston and Hubble and the two from the stars went with them. Outside in the plaza were still gathered thousands of the middle-towners, Millhand, housewife, banker and bookkeeper, the old men and the little children. They were still happy, and they cheered, sending up a great joyous shout to echo from the towers. Mayor Garris took the microphone of the loudspeaker system. Folks, listen carefully. These new people are telling us now that we ought to leave Earth. They say they'll give us a better world, somewhere out there among the stars. What about it? Do you want to go, away from Earth?" There was a long moment of utter silence, in which Keniston saw the Middletowners' faces grow bewildered, incredulous. He looked at Van Allen's clear-cut face, and saw that the shadow of weariness on it was deeper. He realized again that two epochs, two utterly different ways of life, were looking at each other here, and finding it difficult to understand each other. When, finally, the crowd of Middletowners had grasped the suggestion, their answer came as a rising chorus of exclamations. "'Go off and live someplace in the sky? Are these people nuts? It was bad enough to leave Middletown for this place but to leave Earth!" A large-handed, stocky man, whom Keniston recognized as Lauber, McLean's truck driver, came to the steps and spoke up to the mayor. "'What's all this about, anyway? We're getting along here all right now. Why would we want to go off to the moon or somewhere?' The mayor turned to the two starfolk. "'You see? My people wouldn't listen to an idea like that for a minute. Keniston told the woman, "'The people completely reject the whole proposal.' Varn Allen stared at him in honest surprise. "'But it is not a proposal. It is a formal order of the Board of Governors. I recommended this evacuation, and they have approved it.' Keniston said dryly, Unfortunately, our people don't recognize any authority but their own government, so the order means nothing to them." The woman looked appalled. "'But nobody defies the governors. They are the executive body of the whole Federation of Stars.' The Federation of Stars? It had a sound of distant thunder in it. And again Keniston realized the incomprehensible, staggering vastness of the civilization out there which this woman and this man represented. 
he said, exasperated. Can't you understand that, to these people, the stars are just points of light in the sky? That your suns and worlds and governors mean nothing to them? Norden Lund chose that moment to intervene. He said smoothly to Varn Allen, Perhaps in an impasse of this nature we should consult Government Center? She gave him a hot look. You would like me to admit my incapacity by doing that? No. I'll carry this matter through, and when it's done, I'll have words to say to Gore Hall for precipitating things prematurely. She turned to Keniston and said, Your people must comprehend that this is not a cruel thing we're doing. Explain to them what life would be like on this dead planet, isolated, precarious, increasingly difficult, with nothing to look forward to but an ultimate dying out of attrition and sheer hopelessness. Perhaps they'll realize then that what they're asking me to do is to abandon them to a very ugly fate." "'Perhaps,' said Keniston, "'but I wouldn't count on it. You don't know us yet. As a people, we're neither soft nor easily frightened. He spoke with hostility, because of the truth that he had recognized in Varn Allen's words, and did not want to recognize. She gave him a level glance, as though she were taking his measure, and threw him the measure of all Middletown. Then she said quietly, "'Bear in mind that a formal decree passed by the Board of Governors is a law which must be respected and complied with. The evacuation has been ordered, and will be carried out." She nodded to Lund, who shrugged and fell in beside her. They went down the steps and across the plaza, and the muttering crowd, alarmed and confused but not yet hostile, moved apart to let them through. Keniston turned to Hubble. "'What are we going to do?' he said, and the older man shook his head. "'I don't know but I know one thing we must not do, and that is to let any violence occur. That would be fatal. We've got to calm people down before that evacuation staff arrives and brings things to a head." Keniston did his best during the rest of that day. He repeated Varn Allen's plea for understanding, but it fell on unreceptive ears. The city was functioning. They had light and water. They were not alone in the universe and life today seemed pretty good. With the irrepressible optimism of the human race, they were convinced that they could make tomorrow even better, and they were not going to leave Earth. That was like asking them to leave their bodies. The shock of losing their own time and the pattern of life that went with it had been terrible enough. It might have overwhelmed them completely, Keniston knew, except that in a measure the shock had been softened. For a while they had kept their own old city, and it was still there beyond the ridge, an anchor in their memories. To a certain extent they had brought their own time with them, for life in the alien city had been adapted as much as possible to the pattern of life in old Middletown. They had oriented themselves again. They had built a facsimile of their familiar existence. It had been hard, but they had done it. They could not now, quite suddenly, throw it all away and start again on something utterly divorced from everything they had ever known. Keniston realized perfectly that it was not only an atavistic clinging to the earth that had bred them which made them reject the idea of leaving it so fiercely. It was the physical and immediate horror of entering a perfectly unknown kind of ship and plunging in it out beyond the sky into... into what? Night and nothingness and sickening abysses that ran on forever, with only the cold stars for beacons, and the earth, the solid, understandable, protecting earth, lost forever. His own mind recoiled from the very imagining. Why couldn't the woman understand? 
why couldn't she realize that a people to whom the automobile was still quite recent were not psychologically capable of rushing into space? The great ship brooded on the plain, and all that afternoon and evening the people drifted restlessly toward the wall of the dome to look at it, and stand in little groups talking angrily, and move away again. The streets seethed with a half-heard murmur of voices and movement. Crowds gathered in the plaza, and a detachment of National Guardsmen in full kit went marching down to mount guard at the portal. Dejected, oppressed, and more than a little sick with worry, Keniston faced the unavoidable and went to Carol. She knew, of course. Everybody in New Middletown knew. She met with him with the drawn, half-bitter look that had come more and more often on her face since the June day their world had ended, and she said, "'They can't do it, can they? They can't make us go.' "'They think they're doing the right thing,' he said. It's a question of making them understand they're wrong." She began to laugh, quite softly, laughter with no mirth in it. "'There isn't any end to it,' she said. First we had to leave Middletown, now we have to leave Earth. Why didn't we stay in our homes and die there if we had to, like decent human beings? It's all been madness ever since, this city, and now... She stopped laughing. She looked at him and said calmly, "'I won't go, Ken.' "'You're not the only one who feels that way,' Keniston told her. "'We've got to convince them of that.' Restlessness wrote him, and he got up and said, "'Let's take a walk. We'd both feel better.' She went out with him into the dusk. The lights were on, the lovely radiance that they had greeted with such joy. They walked, saying very little, burdened with their own thoughts, and Keniston was conscious again of the barrier that seemed always between them now, even when they agreed. Their silence was not the silence of understanding, but the silence which is between two minds that can communicate only with words. They drifted toward the section of the dome through which the distant starship was visible. The unease in the city had grown until the air quivered with it. There was a mob around the portal. They did not go close to it. Through the curved, transparent wall the lighted bulk of the Thanos was no more than a distorted gleaming. Carol shivered and turned away. "'I don't want to look at it,' she said. "'Let's go back.' "'Wait,' said Keniston. "'There's Hubble.' The older man caught sight of him and swore. "'I've been hunting the hell and gone over town for you,' he said. "'Ken, that bloody fool Garrus has blown his stop completely, and is getting the people all stirred up to fight. You've got to come with me and help soothe him down.' Keniston said bitterly, "'No wonder Varn Allen thinks we're a bunch of primitives. Oh, all right, I'll come.' We'll walk you back home on the way, Carol." They started back through the streets, whose towers now shone timelessly beautiful in the calm white radiance. But the people in those streets, the little tense talking groups, the worried faces and questions, the angry expletives, jarred against that supernal calm. The pulse of unease in the city seemed to quicken. A low cry ran along the streets. People were calling something. A shout was running along the ways, hands pointed upward, white faces turned and looked at the shimmer of the great dome above. "'What?' Hubble began impatiently, but Keniston silenced him. "'Listen!' They listened. Above the swell of distant voices, growing louder every moment, they heard a sound that they had heard only once before a vibration, more than a sound, a deep bass humming from the sky, too deep to be smothered even by the dome. It came downward, and it was louder and louder, and then, quite suddenly, it stopped. 
people were running now toward the portal and the words they shouted came drifting confusedly back. "'Another starship,' said Keniston. "'Another starship has come.' Hubble's face was gray and haggard. "'The evacuation staff. She said they'd arrive soon. And the whole town ready to blow off. Ken, this is it.' End of chapter 12